You and I live in a world of letters. You and I get a lot of emails, but we also get regular mail too, and you have to be able to sort through that mail and find what do you keep and what do you throw away. I mean, there's a lot of letters that you get. For example, how many of you ever got this? Publishers clearing, <laughs> clearing house sweepstakes, right? $7,000 for life, says it all over the envelope, gives you this big promise, and the pitch is pretty sweet. I mean, you don't have to buy anything, and they say, since 1967, we've given away $315 million. I mean, it sounds pretty nice, but when you start to take a look at the promise, they say, well, one in several hundred million win this grand prize. And according to one article that I read, the odds were actually 1.1 1 .1 to 1, 1 in 1, sorry, 1 in 1 1.7 billion. It was hard to say. I mean, that's a big number, right? Look, the odds of winning the Powerball are better. It's about 1 in 292 million. So compared to that, the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstake, I mean, it's practically sure thing, sure thing with the Powerball. But we got, a, we got a lot of different letters, don't we? And some letters you kind of go, then you put in the trash. Other letters, however, you open up immediately <laughs> because you know that it carries a certain amount of authority, right? If you get a letter, a true letter from the IRS that doesn't just go on the pile, that's the first one to get opened. So we open up letters that have authority with them. We also open up love letters. Now this is an actual picture of a fellow who wrote a love letter and on all of his envelopes, he illustrated them. Yeah, I mean, it is an awe, isn't it? If you would open that up, you kind of go, oh, that's so sweet. And so you and I, we open up certain lover, letters that have authority, that have love. Well, this morning we are beginning a series on the seven letters to the churches from the book of Revelation. And they are letters that have full authority and that are written in love. Now you're gonna find these letters in chapter two and three in the book of Revelation. But before we get to that, I thought it would be very important for us to start with chapter 1. Because in chapter 1, we find promises already made. We find promises, we find authority, we find the love of Christ Jesus. So these letters that we're going to get into carry both authority and love of Christ. And so this morning in chapter 1, and by the way, in chapter 1, there's there's enough in here to do two or three messages, so I'm gonna to try to do it in one sermon here and encapsulate certain parts of it for us before we get to chapters two and three where the seven letters are. So this morning, we're going to take a look at letters of promise, the letter of authority, and then a little bit just on the recipients who are gonna receive the letter. So let's go to the letter of promise. It actually starts in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. There's a prologue. We're going to go to verse 3. Verse 3 says this, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So the book really starts off with a promise. If you had the envelope, it'd have the promise on the outside. Or if you open up and looked at the very first part of the letter, it would say, here's a promise that you have from the book of Revelation. It is a blessing, or we would call it a beatitude. Now, the beatitude might sound familiar to you. We find that in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So what is this word blessed, though? I mean, that's the question. What does it mean to be blessed? Some translations, by the way, 
put this word as happy. But that doesn't really work, does it? I mean, happy are the poor in spirit? Happy are those who mourn? So we can't actually translate that word blessed into happy. It just doesn't work that way. Because you know what? Happiness is a subjective state. It's how I feel about something. But when the word of God says, blessed are you, it is something that God declares to you. It is an objective declaration of God. It is a positive judgment that God gives you. It means to be approved. Or you could say this, that blessed is a pronouncement of God's favor. God pronounces you favored. But this favor that he gives in this promise is conditional. So, it says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Three words, read, hear, and keep. I want to focus on the words hear and keep. Now, Jesus talked about this a lot. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, was he talking about just the sound coming in the ears? He wasn't, was he? It was to be able to take in and discern what he is saying. We aren't just supposed to listen to the word of God. We're supposed to really take it in. In Romans, it talks about being transformed by the renewing of your mind, by God's word. We're supposed to take it in. And I really want to emphasize this this morning because when we get to the letters, there are some very important things that are going to be covered in the letters. And it is not going to be just a cakewalk. Like we spent four weeks in heaven and that was, it was, it was lovely, wasn't it? It was very comforting. I want to let you know that the next series here, there is going to be um, some thorns in these roses. And the thorns can actually prick you very deeply in here if you have ears to hear. So you are blessed if you actually take it in. But what's the other part of this? It says, and he who keeps what is written. To keep, to do what is written. So, so many times we go to church or we do a Bible study and we kind of go, yep, understood that, okay, has some depth, has it meaning, and then we don't live that out. But here it says, the blessing, God's favor is for those who keep what is written, to do it. Again, this should be no surprise to us. James covers this very, very thoroughly. James chapter 1, starting verse 22. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 11, blessed rather are the ones who hear the word of God and keep it. So this is the blessing. This, if, if you got an envelope, right, and it said, blessed are you who read, hear, and keep. Right? That, I mean, that's like on the envelope or on the very first paragraph of this letter that you would receive. So it is in the, keeping, the reading, hearing, keeping of God's word that we are blessed. Now, if you got a letter like that, you would want to say, who wrote this letter? It's the person who wrote this letter, do they have any authority to actually fulfill that particular promise? So now we want to go to the authority of who wrote the letter. We're going to take a look at three things. By the way, there are sermon notes for those who want to use the sermon notes. Keeping along with this, it might be helpful, especially in this section, to go with the sermon notes. Okay, the authority. 
So we're going to go to the prologue. Now the prologue's different. If you take a look at the letters from Paul, if you take a look at the letters from Peter or Jude, they actually start off with their name first. Paul, an apostle of. Peter, an apostle of. So they state who they are first, and they put the authority from their apostolic position. But this is very different in the book of Revelation. It actually starts off with the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So he is putting very upfront, this is from Jesus Christ. Two words. First, his name, Jesus. We covered this actually a lot in the last four weeks, the name of Jesus and how exalted the name of Jesus. But then we also have Christ. And Christ is a title that Jesus has. It means the anointed one, the one who is to redeem Israel. It points to Jesus as the Redeemer, the Lamb of God. So right here in the very beginning, the authority of the name of Jesus, the Redeemer, the Lamb of God. And again, remember the Lamb of God from chapter 5 in Revelation that we covered that. And yet, people would say, well, is he God? Jesus Christ, is he God? And yes, we tie that in numerous places in the first chapter. Let's tie it in here. He writes, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. Now, right here, he points to God the Father. He doesn't use the name God the Father, does he? But he says, to the one who is and was and who is to come. By the way, if you remember, again, we're tying all this in. If you remember from chapter 4, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's what they say around the throne regarding God the Father. So there's no question that this is God the Father. But why doesn't John just say God the Father? He actually uses a very elongated name here. Who was and is and is to come. It means that there is no beginning and no end. God simply is. And if you were to say, he is, or in the first person, I am. This is the name of God, right? Back from Exodus, Moses at the burning bush. Who shall I say sent me? I am. So this is the eternal name of God. It is simply in long form. Now, I want you to bookmark that, by the way. Mentally bookmark what we just covered, because we're going to get back to that a little bit. Okay, mentally bookmark that. There's also the Holy Spirit here. It says, and the seven spirits who are before the throne. Do you remember what seven was? It's very symbolic, used a lot in Revelation. It means complete or perfect. And we know that this, the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits, the complete spirit of God, this would be the Holy Spirit, also ties back to a prophecy in Zechariah. Okay, so now... John saying, from the Father and from the Holy Spirit, and now he includes the Son. I'm going to take a look at the Son and his role and office, his offices and role. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the king, ruler of kings on the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever 
and ever. And behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Look, the entire book of Revelation is given by Jesus, and he is the object of the entire book of Revelation. Everything comes from him, everything is for him, about him. Now, he talks in here, in this letter that we have, we have three different offices. And you, there's actually more, but I'm just, I'm trying to narrow it down because I'm trying to do a lot here, biting a lot off a lot this morning. We find that he is a prophet. He is the faithful witness. To be a faithful witness is to speak the word of God. And what does Jesus do? He speaks nothing but the word of God. He is the word of God. He is also the king. He is the ruler over all of the kings of the earth. And he is also a redeemer who has freed us from our sins by his blood. You don't have to go far into this letter to find the gospel message, do you? That we are redeemed. And we covered that a lot regarding the Lamb of God, our Redeemer, in chapter 5 of Revelation. Okay, so here, you got this letter, right? This promise. You're going to be blessed. Who is it from? You're like looking at the signature, and you find, oh, it is from Jesus Christ. And it's got the office of prophet, of king, the role of redeemer. Now, in commercials, they'd say, but wait, there's more. As a matter of fact, with Christ, there is so much more. It is just unbelievable. So we're going to dig in a little bit further here. We're going to take a look at the nature, because look, if you've got somebody in a particular office, do you want to say, do they have the right character? to be able to make good on the promises that are forthcoming. And so we're going to take a look at the character or what we call the nature of Jesus. Starting with verse 13. And in the midst of the lamp stands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he had seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in his full strength. By the way, why I don't have many pictures this morning is because how would you picture that? I found one picture that came closest to it, but it would probably in the vernacular freak you out. Because this is a picture of Jesus in his glorified state. He is exalted. And what we find about the nature, the character of Christ is this we find that he is holy. He has holiness. He is the source of holiness. It is given by the color white, the white representing purity. And it is as if he were wearing a crown of holiness. By the way, this ties directly back, and you can do it later on today, this ties back to our reading from Daniel. In Daniel, it said, as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days, that is God the Father, the Ancient of Days took his seat, his clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. Hmm, that's attributed directly to Christ Jesus here. We also find his omniscience, his all-knowing ability. And that is symbolized by his, the, his eyes, the blazing fire. Nothing can withstand his gaze. There is nothing that can be hidden from him. 
And it also says from his mouth, and this is, I mean, picture this, right? From his mouth is a sharp two-edged sword. And that two-edged sword we actually find referenced here in Hebrews chapter 4. For the word of God is living and active. The word of God, who is the word of God? It is Christ Jesus himself. He is the word. That sh sword, sharper than a, that uh, from his mouth, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him of whom we must give account. This is Jesus, fully omniscient. There's nothing that could be hidden from him, which is both comforting and scary. Now, his omnipotence, his all-powerful, talks about feet like polished brass. The, the better sense of it is here, gold and bronze, but not cold, but hot from the furnace, hot from the fire. So wherever he would step, there would be nothing left in his path. And his voice, the roar of the sound of rushing waters. We talked about the trumpet last time, now he's got a voice like this roaring waters. You ever been by a waterfall where it's just pouring down and you can't hear anything else and everything's drowned out? That is the power and might of him. And that he is also eternal. This is the picture of Jesus, the victorious one. He says he is the first and the last, the living one who died and behold alive is evermore and has the keys of death and Haiti. Now, remember I asked you to mentally bookmark something about God the Father, his eternal state, who was and is and is to come? Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, some translations, by the way, or um, References say that's God the Father speaking, but I can't get that from the context. I believe that is Christ speaking directly there, and he also says, I am the Alpha and the Omega at the very end. So in his glorified presence, this is the picture of him who gave the letter to John. What would you do in the presence of the glorified Christ. Do you know the song, I Can Only Imagine? Very popular song, I Can Only Imagine. It says, I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. It's a beautiful song, but it misses part of it. Here's what John did. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. <laughs> That's what John did. In the glorified presence of Christ, he fell as dead. But I said it's a love letter too, right? And what does he say to John? He says, fear not. Fear not. For those in Christ, there is no fear. So this is the picture of the one who wrote the letter. And the one who writes the letters to seven churches. He has the, his name, his office, his nature or character. And then he told John, write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. And so John writes, doesn't he? And he's going to take down the revelation to the seven churches. So now let's get to the recipient of the letter. 
There are seven churches. It says, write what you have seen in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna and to Pergamum and Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Now, brothers and sisters, there is much symbolism within Revelation. There is much. Some people say these are just symbolic churches, but no, they're, they're there. They're physically there on the map. So each week on the front of your bulletin, you'll see that we, as we go through, it'll be pointing to one of the different churches on the map. They are real churches with real people with good and bad things happening within the church. At the same time, there is symbolism associated with each of the churches. And we don't have to worry about what the symbolism, because Jesus explains it. He says, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Seven, what does seven again mean? Complete, perfect. So he's got seven. So when it says the seven angels of the churches, we would understand that to mean the pastors, angels being messengers. So to the pastors of the church. And seven, does it mean only those seven pastors? No, it means all pastors. <coughs> and then it talks about the seven churches. Look, there were a lot of other churches around in the area, but it is seven. It means the church as a whole. And do you notice that they are given as stars and lamps? Both give off light, don't they? And thus, it is to the churches, the pastors and the churches, who are to be the light of Christ in the world. And this is the message, right? That you and I are to be the light of Christ in the world for others. And the letters that we're going to be going through say, you, you and I together are to be the light of Christ into the world to share the gospel message with everyone. From our reading, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people put a, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. This is what we're going to be doing for the next seven weeks going forward. Learning what it means to be the light of Christ in the world. So for you today, this morning, are you willing to receive God's blessing by reading and hearing and keeping what's written? What we're going to cover. Do you acknowledge and submit to the full authority of Jesus and all that he has written? Again, hears, doers, because of who he is. Not to try to earn your way into heaven, but because of who he is. The Lamb of God. And finally, will you heed his letters to the churches so that you may be a witness of his light and the gospel message to the world? That's the preface to all of the seven letters that we're going to cover. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth in Christ Jesus. Jesus, we praise you. We praise you for all that you are. Grant through the Holy Spirit that we are encouraged and empowered to hear and keep your word and be your light. In your name we pray, amen. We hope that you've been blessed by this message. If you have any questions or you would like to grow deeper in your faith, please visit our website at joyccc.com. Again, that's joyccc.com.